I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm uh, talking with Ryan White, the director of Good, the documentary Good Night Oppie, as part of our Meet the Experts film documentary panel. Uh, first thing I wanted to ask you about this was, um, you know, what's interesting about the Fui is that yeah, there there are these wonderful recreations of what the rovers on Mars looked like when they were on there doing their work, and I was curious, were you nervous about you know having the film rely on visual effects recreations of the of the rovers? Um, I wasn't nervous about relying on it. I was nervous about entering a world of filmmaking that I had never done before, which is which is visual effects. But what I learned very quickly in working with um, Industrial Light and Magic, who did the visual effects in Goodnight Oppie, um, is that they love information. They love facts. And so uh, those visual effects that you see in our film are completely rooted in the photography of the robot. So each each robot, my, my documentary is about two twin sister robots, uh, Spirit and Opportunity. Each of them had nine cameras on them during their, their lifetimes. And so that was hundreds of thousands of photos over the course of those lives that they took. And there's also two orbiters that are satellites that roam around Mars taking photos down on the terrain. So we know at this point exactly what Mars looks like. Um, it had just never been brought to life in a photo real way in a film before. So that was my uh, initial conversation with Industrial Light and Magic was, was like, is this even possible? Can you take all of this photography and information that we have and create a completely photo real authentic Mars essentially make it move because we have the photographs and you know that is a very long process um, as a documentary filmmaker as I'm sure a lot of the panelists will will speak about most of us tend to be very run and gun most of my films are but this was visual effects that were going to take over a year to create so it had to be prescribed very early on um, what those scenes were going to be in the film and then you know, six months ago, sitting in a movie theater as we're getting the final renders in was one of the best filmmaking experiences I've ever had, just watching that come alive in front of our eyes. Uh, uh, you also have a, a wonderful casting choice in the movie for the uh, voiceover of the uh, uh, the vo main voiceover that we hear in Angela Bassett. And I was wondering how what made you choose Angela Bassett uh, as the main voiceover performer for this? Well, the, the the little gay boy in Georgia growing up saw What's Love Got to Do With It, I think four or five times in the movie theater. So I'm a huge Angela Bassett fan, always have been, not exaggerating. That was the voice I had in my head the entire time I was making the film. So for a year and a half, it was my production assistant, James Robinson. It was his voice reading the over diaries um but angela was always what i what i wanted to have in the in the final film so she's reading a lot i've seen a lot of people write about it as as narration but like i didn't i didn't write those words that angela is reading in my film they are daily diaries that someone at nasa wrote while the rover is in some sort of uh crisis or some sort of discovery and so for me, that's normally a documentary filmmaker, and I don't really make historical films or retrospective films. Once I discovered that that was written every day, it was a way, I thought, as a narrative device to keep the audience on the journey day to day with the robot. So it's not looking back and knowing that they died, which they did, spoiler alert, but it's a way throughout the course of the film to keep you on that day to day adventure. And so when we reached out to Angela, I was certain that she would say no, like, I don't, I don't do documentaries, uh, or no, I won't be in your little Mars film. And she said yes, right away. It was the next day we got a yes from her. And recording with Angela was one of uh, was such a joy. You know, we had an amazing sound designer, Mark Mangini, who also did, you know, Mad Max Fury Road, he did Dune, he did the Star Trek films. And we recorded Angela in a way that's different um, to everyone else in my film. And so there were microphones all around Angela while she was reading those diaries. So if you see the film um, in a theater, she's coming, she's coming from everywhere. So um, uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, have there been any reactions to the film from audiences 
that have genuinely surprised you in uh, their reaction to uh, to this movie? Well, literally before this panel, that's why I was a couple minutes late. I was doing a Q&A with 800 uh, fourth graders. Uh, but I also went to a screening in San Francisco. I mean, it's, I think it's just a few days ago. Everything's a blur right now where I went in and I didn't realize uh, who the screening was for. And I was just going to do a Q&A. And as I walked in with Jess, my my producing partner, it was like really loud, like people were talking as we walked in. And I was like, oh, this is a this is an awful screening. People are just like talking during our movie. And then like a bright shot came on and I was able to look at the audience and it was all students. It was all public uh, public school students from San Francisco that they had brought for an educational screening in San Francisco. And it was incredible to watch. Like they were so loud. I was only there for the last 30 minutes of the film, but like when Opportunity discovers water or when she takes her selfie, they were like standing up and screaming and high-fiving each other uh, during those scenes. And the final five minutes of my film as Perseverance, the new, the latest Rover launches as the end of my film as she as she launches into space. They were just all standing and cheering. And normally that would be horrifying because it's the final five minutes of your film and you could hear none of the dialogue, none of the sound design. Um, but Jess and I had like tears, tears rolling down because the idea, you know, I, I it's so rare as a documentary filmmaker. And I've never made a film that's appropriate for for young audiences. And so to have made something that can have an audience that extends down to, you know, fourth grade, fifth grade uh, has been really thrilling. So I think those were the screenings, uh, nothing against adults, but I think those are the screenings that will 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 stand out in the end. That actually, uh, I want to piggyback off that because one of the things that I was also curious about is, um, you know, it, it, all, it often feels like the idea of pursuing careers in engineering and space exploration that that are linked to like space exploration are very are are you know it's they're they're not as pursued as they used to be and i was wondering if uh you hope that this film can help steer younger people to possibly pursue a career in one of those fields that could land them at nasa and help further space exploration absolutely i mean i think more so than any film i've ever made i was conscious of the audience in this film and like I grew up, I was a total nerd growing up. I went to a math and science nerdy school. I wanted to be an astronaut and it never, it never happened. And, you know, even one of my best friends is an astrophysicist now. And so I know what it's like to be around those types of people that aspire to do those types of things. But we were very conscious in the film of making sure, you know, there's only 11 human beings in my film. And kind of by happenstance, but a little bit by design, almost all of them are outsiders in some type of way. You know, it's not all Americans. It's a lot of international people um, that work all, on these missions, even though it's NASA. And we wanted to be very careful in deciding, you know, we have you have to be judicious. Every documentary filmmaker does on how many voices you include. So if you can only include, I think it began as eight and we extended it to 11 people. Um, we wanted kids that might see this film to see themselves represented on screen. And I was doing um, press yesterday with a lot of Indian outlets. Um, and there's an Indian woman in this film who's from rural India. And she got a book from a family member when she was five. That was a book about space and it changed the trajectory of her entire life. And now she works for NASA as a rover driver. And the Indian press was so excited to talk about her being in my film and what an important role uh, she plays on this missions. And so that's just one example. But we were very conscious, like if a, if, a, if a young Indian girl is watching this film, that she will see that it's possible um, to go into this field, even though it might feel impossible wherever she is right now. And um, just uh, one last question very quickly. Uh, were there any other Rover wake up songs that weren't mentioned in the film, but that you found particularly amusing? No, the, the, so the Rovers were only supposed to last for 90 days. So that's two Rovers. That would be 180 wake up songs. Spirit lasted seven and a half years and Opportunity lasted 15 years. So when you do that math, it's thousands of wake up songs. So 
we had basically the <laughs> we had basically any song that's ever been written was an option for a wake up song. Um, and it definitely was one of the bigger challenges in making this film was having to, you know, like, of course, Bowie's Life on Mars was a wake up song. It's a film about Mars. When we finally cut that scene where it was used, it was devastating because I love I love Bowie. I love that song. But eventually it came down to if a scene was really great and we found that music being played in a room and it was an essential scene to the film, we we ended up favoring that one over others. And, you know, I won't say which there's seven. There's seven very famous songs in my film. I won't say which, but there's a couple of them that are songs that. I just do not enjoy and have never enjoyed. And the fact that they were chosen over like a Bowie song still kills me to this day. But the song was used in a way that was so essential to the story that we that we took the plunge. Uh, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on our panel in just a little bit. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby. And today, and today I'm speaking with uh, Sacha Jenkins, the director of the doc Apple TV Plus documentary, Louis Armstrong, Black and Blues, uh, as part of our Meet the Experts film documentary panel. Um, the how, how familiar were you with Louis Armstrong as both a musician and a cultural figure uh, before you started working on this documentary? Well, growing up in Queens, New York, I knew that Armstrong at one point lived in Queens. I knew that there was a, a elementary school or a junior high school named after him. I knew the hits um, and that was about it. I knew he was really good at what he did and that was pretty much the extent of it. Uh, so um, what made you uh, want to, uh, you know, having that very basic understanding of him, what made you want to uh, make a documentary film that centered on his life and uh, his work? Well, the nice people over at Imagine Entertainment called me with the opportunity and I then I dove in and did the research and I was completely floored by what I learned about Armstrong. He was the exact opposite of who I thought he might have been based on being a young black kid in New York in the 80s, finding my identity, being into sort of this black consciousness uh, that hip hop was sort of delivering at the time. And, you know, his mannerisms and what I thought I knew about him felt contrary to the revolution or felt contrary to sort of being pro-Black um, based on what other people might have said, not based on what I knew, but what older people might have said or based on my perception of how he carried himself. And when I did the research, it was completely the opposite of that. And I found out that he was probably the most talented person ever. And I can't name anyone in the modern era who had as many talents and on the level of talent that he had. So, um, one of the one of the interesting choices you made with this movie is, even though it's uh, it, you're this documentary about a musician, uh, you did have the choice to have original music for the film uh, scored by uh, Terrence Blanchard. And I'm wondering as to why uh, you chose to have original music for the film rather than uh, rather than um, uh, just the just the music of Louis Armstrong. Well, there's plenty of music from Louis Armstrong, but um, the music that Blanchard made, who was a, a master musician from New Orleans, he knew not to make something that would compete with Armstrong. If anything, it would enhance the film and support the film. So uh, he was very conscious of making music that wouldn't compete or try to step on because you never could step on the music of Louis Armstrong. So we, we had the full blessing of the folks who are the wards of the everything that is Louis Armstrong, but at the end of the day, the music also costs money. You couldn't, you know, even if I wanted to have wall-to-wall -wall Armstrong music, it would exponentially raise the, what it would cost to make it. But at the same time, to get an original score from Terrence Blanchard, I mean, what could be better than that? I can't, I, I, I can, I'm having trouble thinking of, of, of anything that could be better than that. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, one of the things I like about how you uh, link everything in the film together is that there are those uh, that is that certain parts are shown like through animation, especially like certain like uh, uh, certain things that Armstrong had said that we see on recordings. And I was wondering what sort what kind of effort went into creating those uh, animated bits of the film. Well, there's an artist that I work with on all my films. His name is Hector Arias, and he is a bit of a savant when it comes to these kinds of things and 
We wanted to do something that got you closer to understanding who Armstrong was. And in real life, Armstrong made this, this collage art, um, not for the public, but for his own self enjoyment. And we felt that finding a way to emulate his style of art would only get us that much closer to understanding who he was and getting, uh, getting us closer into how he thought. So um, it was a way to marry the visual aesthetic of Armstrong that a lot of people don't know about with the man himself. Um, did you learn anything about Armstrong during the course of making the film that really surprised you or caught you off guard? Well, again, uh, being, you know, I fancy myself a Renaissance man, but I could, I'm not a Renaissance man with the level of skill that uh, Armstrong had. And, the fact that he was, you know, not formally educated and was like a prolific writer to me said a lot. Uh, I was a fan of his artwork. Um, the way he sang changed the way popular music was recorded, changed the way people sang. Um, on his instrument, he was a pioneer. Um, he was funny. He wasn't trying to be a comedian. He was just naturally funny. And he just reminded me of people I grew up with, you know, you grew up with people in the inner city who don't have social capital, don't have the opportunities, but have all this talent and um, don't always have ways to funnel it. And sometimes they wind up behind bars the way Armstrong did. But um, I saw, I found a lot of inspiration, but I also felt like he was a character I knew. And that's why in many ways, one of the reasons why I wrote, reached out to Nas to be the narrator of the film he and I grew up in the same neighborhood. And for us, you know, so many of us didn't make it. But for us in Queens, the part of Queens that I'm from, Nas was our personal Louis Armstrong. Was there anything with um was there anything with Armstrong that uh, or with uh or that you learned that um you found you found out about Armstrong that you thought was really interesting, but for one reason or another you couldn't include it in the documentary and it ended up on the cutting room floor? Was there any uh material like that that um uh you had for this? Yeah, I mean, he, in many ways, he felt, du you know, he was an ambassador for the United States government and for the United States people with his instrument around the world. And, you know, he started to feel duped by the government because obviously, you know, uh, people like him or people who look like him weren't treated as full citizens. And he's very frustrated by America. And, you know, you're in these foreign countries, particularly in Africa and you know, you're looking at the shiny object, which is Armstrong, but there are things happening behind the scenes uh, that the government uh, might have been involved with that weren't necessarily savory. So it's a very complicated story inside of that, um, that you would need a whole film to get into to unpack. I only had an hour and 44 minutes. There's no way I could have unpacked that in six minutes. I, mean, I was I was wondering if you could also go into go into a bit of detail about the struggle of the the dichotomy that Armstrong had as uh, as a you know a, a pop culture figure, but also you know at this at this uh, weird time where you know uh, the civil rights movement was coming into focus, and how he felt like did he how he felt he had did he did he feel like he had to address that or uh, did he did he, or did he walk that tightrope? Do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, I mean, it's complicated because at the end of the day, he's just an artist. He didn't sign up to be a civil rights activist, right? So he's a man of a different time. Uh, he's in movies where he's singing to horses, right? So if you're uh, a, a Black revolutionary or a young Black person who is has a certain level of consciousness, you see a man singing to a horse, you're going to think that's not really cool. As a matter of fact, it's like, you know, it's racist. It's all these kinds of things. Right. But Armstrong was a man of a different time. And he was also a man of a certain age. And so when civil rights was happening, why would you expect him to, you know, sort of um, march and put his life on the line? I mean, people were being physically uh, attacked and he had a fear of, you know, getting wrapped in the mouth with a billy club or something like that. And his position was, you know, I contribute by, you know, making donations to certain causes. And if I get wrapped in the mouth uh, at a protest, there's no way I can contribute anymore. I can't put up any money. And so you've got to consider the time that he's from, 
you got to consider this is a guy who's built, born in the South in 1901, which is just basically slavery ended in 65, but probably not really in 1901 if you're in the South. So he had, to, if you think about the emotional, psychological, and spiritual jujitsu that he had to perform to become who he became, um, you know, you have a different sort of idea on who he is because most people uh, would have just wanted to fight or said to hell with all this and um, would have cracked under the pressure, but because he was able to find creative ways to keep going. I mean, he's the reason why so many black artists have had the opportunities before him. There was no one, there was no global pop star before he's the first pop star, regardless of color. Um, but before him there, you know, he's the first African-American to have a radio show, the first African-American to get proper billing in a film. I mean, he, so many firsts happened because of Armstrong. And if he didn't can carry himself the way that he did, he would have been murdered. Well, uh, Sacha, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you in our, on our panel in just a little bit. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby. And today I'm speaking with Isabel Castro, the director of the documentary Miha as part of our Meet the Experts film documentaries panel. Uh, first question I wanted to ask is, um, what made you want to reach out to uh, the subject, of the, the, the first subject film, Munoz, and address uh, the idea of uh, children of immigrants in the music industry? Um, so I, I had been covering immigration for a long time, and I was looking to do a story about um, kind of the intergenerational effects of, of parents deciding to move to this country. I really wanted to show the ways that children of immigrants carried that, um, that decision in their lives. And so I, at, this, at the same time, I also wanted to try to do it in a way that felt totally different from the other kind of immigration stories I'd done before. I wanted the, I wanted the tone to be accessible. I wanted it to appeal to a young audience and I wanted, um, to do it, you know, I I wanted it to do it in a way that wasn't so on the nose, and so um, I thought I thought of that music might be a really good way into uh, that. I, I wanted to make like a music documentary that touched upon all of these ideas and these themes, and so um, I had come across Kuko and his music, and I reached out to Doris Munoz, who was his manager at the time, because I was just so inspired by what he was doing for his community. Um, and, um, he, you know, he was this rising pop star that was singing in Spanglish and really appealed to young kind of uh, Chicano uh, listeners. And so I reached out to her um, and over the course of a few months, I just got to know her really well, got to know her story. Um, and, and she invited me out to film a concert that she had organized and, that concert is the first scene in the film. Uh, now, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, uh, prior to being a, a filmmaker, you worked as a journalist, correct? That yeah, was, I mean, I, yeah. Well, but it's, what I was gonna, what I wanna ask is, you know, did any of your skills as a journalist inform your approach of, uh, as a documentary filmmaker? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I made I made my first film when I was 18. Um, I I had always wanted to be a documentary filmmaker um, and uh, making that first film exposed me to the real challenges and difficulties of being an independent filmmaker. And so I went into journalism. I went into broadcast uh, news kind of as a way to still use these kind of skills that I uh, you know, really am passionate about um, and do storytelling, but I felt that broadcast news was kind of a way to do it in a way that felt more financially stable, more um, just uh, more pragmatic in a way. And so I did that for many years. I worked for Vice on HBO. I worked for uh, the New York Times, but um uh, you know, eventually I realized that independent filmmaking was really my passion. Like, I really love the ability to have subjectivity in the storytelling approach and to really kind of um, inject uh, a story with um, a personal kind of viewpoint. And so um, I, I went into Miha 
uh, on the tail end of just, you know, doing many years of broadcast journalism and those skills certainly carried over. Like, I think one of the most kind of, um, uh, one of, in production when COVID hit and the music industry came to a halt, I think, you know, a lot of folks that were supporting the film were really kind of questioning whether or not the film was going to be able to continue. Um, and I had done so many years in breaking news that I just kind of had this, like the muscle to just like keep going and just know, you know, the experience of knowing that sometimes the story is not immediately there, but if you kind of just, uh, the tenacity of journalism is something that, um, that definitely carried over into this project. Um, so, um, uh, the other uh, main person that we get into with the in the documentary is Jax Haupt. And uh, what I was wondering was including Jax always a, a, a part of the doc, a plan to be part of the documentary, or did that come about later in the filming? It came about later in the filming. I mean, you know, halfway through the film, or no, a third of the way through the film, the pandemic hits and Doris, who's a music manager, I mean, her life has just turned upside down. And, you know, the mu music industry comes to a complete standstill. Um, she loses her biggest client. And I think Doris was in a real state of kind of confusion about what to do next. And, um, you know, her instinct is really, she, she now, since the movie was made, she's now making her own music, but she really has this like inherent instinct to want to, let she like gravitates towards uh, talent and like young talent. And I think she had found Jax on Instagram and was just so um, passionate about her music. I mean, she was listening to her music nonstop and um, trying to figure out a way to support her um, while at the same time, not knowing whether she wanted to be a manager or not. Um, and it was at that point that, you know, I kind of just went along for the ride. Like she wanted to reach out, she reached out to Jax. Um, and I, I reached out to Jax, I pre, you know, I pre-interviewed her over the course of a few weeks and got to know her and, um, and thought it was really interesting. I, I thought it would be interesting to see, uh, a manager mentor kind of take a young artist from the beginning. And, uh, something else I was, um, I was, I'm curious about, because I don't want to make any uh, assumptions here, but uh, I, I, I don't know if you're uh, 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 daughter, of, uh, daughter of immigrants or not, but um, uh, was there any part of uh, Munoz's uh, and Haupt's uh, experience that uh, really, that really uh, touched you and you connected with? Oh, certainly. I mean, I, I was born in Mexico. Um, I moved here when I was really young and um, I got, uh, we got our citizenship when I was 17. Um, and that, you know, the experience of growing up kind of uncertain about our visas and our green cards and um, uh, instilled like a real um, uh, like curiosity about how immigration policy works. Like it felt really arbitrary and insecure and, um, and volatile. And I think, you know, me and my parents always, my family always grew up with like a certain amount of just anxiety around it. Um, and so that was like extremely formative. And, you know, we were, we were so lucky to have gotten our papers, but um, you know, I, I, I grew up also very close to an undocumented family and they, I just felt like really confused by kind of how arbitrary and how unfair the whole process felt. And, um, and so that's always kind of been the driving force behind my work. Like I, you know, um, a lot of my work has just been concerned, you know, concerned with trying to uh, understand and unpack immigration policy in the United States. Um, beyond that, like, I think the thing that I connect with the most in the film is the pressure that children of immigrants face, you know, like I, my parents sacrificed a lot to come to this country. Um, they worked really, really hard and gave me like an insanely privileged life. Um, but it came at the expense of their own dreams and their own ambitions. And it was, you know, their decisions, their entire lives have always been in service of us. And so um, that's always been a huge burden. It's always been a huge burden that I've carried. It's what motivates me every day. And, 
um, when you're pursuing a creative uh, profession, it feels, you know, that exacerbates the burden because we are, we are uh, undertaking such an uncertain career path. And so um, I, I felt a lot of, um, I, that, that's kind of also kind of a big conversation within the film. It's just looking at um, the additional obstacles that, um, you know, uh, young uh, children of immigrants, people of color face in pursuing their dreams, especially in creative professions. It's, it's you know, it's hard as it is. And then it's additionally hard when you have to face those, those, those other obstacles. Well, uh, Isabel, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on our panel in just a little bit. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with Matthew Heineman, the director of the documentary Retrograde, uh, as part of our Meet the, Meet the Experts film documentary panel. First thing I wanted to ask is uh, your, your main character in this movie, uh, General uh, Sadat, um, uh, you say that he's hoping to return to Afghanistan and fight back against the Taliban. And is that still something that he is hoping to pursue? Yes. I mean, he, he's, he's currently in exile. Uh, and, you know, I think that pursuit of, of taking back his country, um, you know, forming armed resistance is a, uh, not something that happens overnight. You know, it'll take months, if not years, if not decades. Um, so that is something that he's currently uh, embarking upon, but, you know the timeline is 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 very vague, and obviously you you're not going to say anything about it here. You know, <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so as the withdrawal from Afghanistan took place amidst the chaos, um, I, I'm, I was curious as to you know as someone who was on the ground watching it happen in real time, what surprised you the most about the execution of the withdrawal? Um, you know, I think with like with most of my films, I, I wasn't there to sort of analyze who was at fault or what went wrong or how we got there. Um, you know, my goal with with retrograde was to try to take again, as with all my films, to try to take this big amorphous subject, uh, the war in Afghanistan, the end of the war in Afghanistan, and trying to humanize it, to try to put a human face to it. And that's certainly what I tried to do in that final chapter of the film at the airport. Um, as thousands of civilians were desperately trying to flee. Uh, I'd never, ever seen anything like it. I've, I've filmed in lots of, you know, conflict zones in my career and in lots of, you know, dangerous situations and very emotional situations and very sad situations. Nothing remotely compared to the, to the feeling of being at the Abbey Gate, which is one of the gates uh, into the airport, as thousands of Afghan civilians were packed like sardines into a four foot deep sewage ditch um, as 18 year old Marines were making these impossible Sophie's choice decisions on who to let in and who not to let in um, as the Taliban was watching at gunpoint a hundred yards away as ISIS was traveling around in, in suicide vests waiting to attack, which happened 12 hours later in the very spot that I was filming in and you know, I just had tears streaming down my face. It was, I kept having to wipe the lens down. And all I could think about was, you know, what have we done? I mean, it's it's interesting you talk about how, you know, you're not looking to point fingers at anything. And I think you show that, uh, you do that pretty well, because right at the beginning, you show all the different, all the different presidents of both parties that have that spe uh, speaking on Afghanistan, showing that this is something that has gone on for so long. Yeah, I mean the, the yeah the point of that opening was 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 multi, multi, you know a multitude of reasons, but I you know for one it was just trying trying to show the for those who are for the uninitiated, you know the time span through which you know this this conflict has uh, existed. You know it's it was a twenty year war, it was the longest war in U.S. history, and you know the the data point in which we enter the story, you know is is this final chapter, but it, but it, but it, it you know. Pre, you know, preceded it for, for two decades. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think our world is divided enough, you know, our, our world is politicized enough. My goal was not to, again, sort of play into the politics of it all. I, I think we're inundated with, with that. And, uh, you know, I wanted to try to, to create a historical document that allowed people from both parties to be able to look back on this moment 
and learn. I mean, the term retrograde is a military term for leaving a war zone. It's, it's obviously, uh, you know, uh, in some ways an allegorical tale of, of something that's happened throughout history uh, and will continue to happen as we fight wars. And, and, and what can we learn from it? So um, there are some amazingly tense sequences in the film. I always, I think of the one where uh, uh, Sadat is in the car, uh, is in uh, is in his. Uh, I, I can't remember where he was going, but you hear the gunshots getting closer, and then you can actually, and then everything just everything just goes crazy. Um, was uh, I'm curious as to, for you and your crew, what was the most dangerous experience? Was that the most dangerous experience you and your crew had while filming, or was there another one that was even uh, 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 more uh, more perilous? I, I'll first start by saying, you know, I, I don't make these films because I enjoy being shot at or, or, or you know, for the danger of it all. It's it's not something that excites me. I don't get off on it. Um, you know, I, I it's always about the story. It's always about the human beings at the center of, 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 the, of the stories that I'm telling. Um, it just so happens that I, I, I have been put in, in, you know, very dangerous situations, as you pointed out, you know, in that car ride, you know, to the front line as we were getting shot at, um, you know, I was in a helicopter on a resupply mission on, at night um, as rockets were being shot at us. Um, you know, there's a scene at the end of the film when I'm with the, the general that we we're following and, and sniper bullets, you know, flew over our heads. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have fear like everyone else has fear and, and that fear affects me. It's, it's had a profound impact on, on me, on my life. Um, you know, I suffer from PTSD, I, I you know, nightmares often. Um, so, the, you know, these, these films take a lot out of you. And uh, I think, you know, in those situations, I have zero agency. I don't know how to shoot a gun. I don't know how to fly a helicopter. I don't know how to, you know, I don't know military tactics per se. Um, so all I can do is focus on shooting, you know, focusing on focusing on, on framing, on aperture, um on the sort of craft of filmmaking and that's what that's what i choose to focus on during those really intense moments just to sort of calm down and you know center myself um uh getting back to um uh uh, uh the the idea of the, the the conflict in afghanistan as a uh, uh you know from a macro perspective and i i what do you think uh you know having been so you know so intimately involved in that and being in being there what do you think is the most misunderstood aspect of our 20 year involvement in Afghanistan? Oof, I, I, I can't answer that question. I mean, I'm not a policy expert. I, you know, I don't, I don't know much more than you do probably about the sort of history of the war in Afghanistan. Um, you know, that's, that's not what I set out to do. That's not the film I made. Um, okay. I, I think the, I don't know. I mean, that's that's again. That's why I I make these films. Is is we're so inundated with with headlines and stats and numbers of, of people lost and the amount of money spent and 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 I think what what gets so lost in these conversations is the human beings at the center of it, um, and 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 that's what I choose to focus on for better or for worse. And I think the what's also often lost in these conversations. Um, are the civilians who are who are you know in war zones the ones that are most affected the ones that just want to live and have a family and you know go to school and have a job and have security um that's why that final those final moments those final days at the airport were, were so devastating to see um because they knew they knew what their fate was they knew what would happen when the taliban took over despite the rhetoric that the taliban was saying you know we're now um you know, girls can't go to school, women can't go outside with their, without their faces covered. We're back to where we were in 2001. Um, and for what? Um, it's So it's, you know, it's, it's very sad to see. And I think, uh, you know, I hope 100 people take 100, 100 different things away from the film. One of them, at the very least, is that, you know, when's the last time you had a conversation about Afghanistan? Um, you know, the war in Ukraine has really usurped so much of the oxygen in international news coverage, and I and I hope that the film, you know, reinvigorates a conversation around uh, again this longest war in U.S. history, but also the people that we left behind.
Well, uh, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on our panel in just a little bit. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and I am uh, leading this uh, Meet the Experts panel for film documentary filmmakers, and we are speaking with Ryan White, the director of Goodnight Oppie, Sasha Jenkins, the director of Louis Armstrong Black and Blues, uh, Isabel Castro, director of Miha, and Matthew Heineman, director of Retrograde. The first question, and I love asking this question of documentary filmmakers, is um, what was what was the uh, film that mo that you saw and you said to yourself, "Yeah, I want to do that. I want to tell these real stories." And um, Isabel, I want to start with you on that one. What was uh, what were what what was one of or some of those films that made that impact on you? Oh, for me, it was Paris is Burning. I um, I. So I wanted, I wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be a photojournalist. I wanted to do conflict photojournalism. And I interned at the New York Times in college. And um, I just got kind of spooked. <laughs> like, it was just like, you know, really low pay, um, you know, really traumatizing um, experiences. And, um, and when I saw Paris is Burning, I was just, I was so like fundamentally changed as a person that I realized that there were stories that I could do um, like, you know, within um, just a few blocks away. Like I just, I realized that there were stories all around me that um, that were hugely impactful and it just, Paris is burning. Um, it was so beautifully shot. I mean, the aesthetics of it just like really, influenced me and made me realize the beauty of documentary cinematography like I just I was totally mesmerized I mean I saw it so many times and um I, I all of my work aspires to reach that level of influence uh, what about you Sasha well my dad was a documentary filmmaker so I kind of grew up uh seeing the power of documentary film and journalism through cameras uh he made lots of different documentaries. Uh, one particular one was about the pyramids in Sudan, which um, most people don't know much about. There are more pyramids in Sudan than there are in Egypt. Um, but uh, he also made a documentary for a show called 30 Minutes, which was the kid's version of 60 Minutes in the 80s. It was a whole expose on fast food restaurants. And I remember loving McDonald's as a kid and then learning that uh, people were being exploited. So it was confusing for me, but... I felt that was uh, something that I could relate to because I liked hamburgers as a kid and uh, saw a way through it there. <laughs> what about you, Matthew? Um, I mean, I had no idea I wanted to be a filmmaker. I was a, I studied history in college. I got rejected from Teach for America and sort of stumbled into film. Um, so I, I can't say like, you know, I, I had a lot of big influences growing up per se. I think as I got into film, I remember seeing Murder Ball, um, a documentary about paraplegic rugby players, and just realizing that that documentaries could be more than the sort of history documentaries that I watched in school. And there could be, you know, three acts, and there could be antagonists and protagonists, and there could be characters that are as interesting, if not more interesting, than you know, movie stars and. And that got me really excited about the potential of this form. And, you know, certainly as, as I progressed in my career, tried to continue to push to make docs feel as, as exciting and interesting as narrative films. So I think that, that film really had a profound impact on me. I cannot tell you how happy that answer made me because Murder Ball is one of my all time favorite documentaries. It is so good. Um, and I feel like not enough people remember that. Um, <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Uh, like Isabel, I thought I was going to be a photographer. That's what I did like all through high school. I loved darkroom photography. When I went to college, I was hoping that I would be a photographer. And but I was always like a film nerd growing up, like loved film. But I grew up in Georgia, like documentary film. My parents were not documentary filmmakers, far from it. Like I didn't even know that that was a medium that you could do. And I will never forget it because I was such a nerd. I like was taking a film class and I had like a, a B plus and I wanted an A in that class. And for extra credit, you could go to this screening and it was an Agnes Varda film. I will not do the French title, but it's the Gleaners and I. 
Um, and I remember like sitting in the movie theater and there were only like five of us in, in the back um, and watching the film and my mind being totally blown. Like, what the fuck is she doing right now? Like, she's like talking to us and she's there's like footage of her in the car. as She's driving along. And like, I remember coming out of that movie theater being not even knowing what a documentary film was and saying like, whatever she was doing, I want to do something like that. And, you know, I still like to shoot a lot myself. And I think documentary filmmaking is one of the few um, careers where you can still do that yourself. And so I'll, 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 I think it's very easy to, for me to pinpoint that moment in a movie theater. Uh, switching gears a little bit, um, uh, we've heard. I, I've, I've asked about. I've asked about what inspired you, and I'm curious as to um, what have you been watching um, lately, uh, and and the, the documentaries, the current documentaries that have uh, um, struck a chord with you over the last couple of years. And I'm just wondering which ones uh, have there been uh, that have done that. Uh, Sacha, I wanted to start with you on that. You know, that's a tough question. Um... I don't always find inspiration in documentary films. I actually find inspiration sometimes in narrative films. Believe it or not, the Planet of the Apes, uh, the first Planet of the Apes, which I, believe it or not, I go back to. And as a kid, I loved, I wanted to be an astronaut, fascinated by time travel. And in the first Planet of the Apes, you know, these astronauts, they blast off and they wind up coming back to Earth. They don't realize it's Earth in the future. And it's actually a black astronaut with them, with Charlton Heston. And so the group splits up and you don't see the black astronaut for a while. And then when you see him again, there's a, uh, a zoo where, first of all, there weren't many, if any, black, because the humans in the film were savages and they didn't speak. So obviously Charlton Heston and the black astronaut actually spoke. But the next time you saw the black astronaut was in this zoo and he was taxidermied. And for me, it speaks to documentary from, from, from my perspective, the kinds of films that I want to make and the things that I want to say and the things that I want to unpack. That was pretty sub subversive. And I guess Rod Sterling was one of the writers on the first Planet of the Apes. And he was a really subversive guy who liked to sort of use popular culture as a way to say things. And so for me, any opportunity to watch something that gives you the opportunity to say something and say something that is um, germane to your identity or something you really uh, care about, um, I draw inspiration from. Well, uh, the, um, uh, now that, that I, I guess I don't have to see the movie now because the ending's been spoiled for me. But um, uh, uh, Matthew, what about you? I'm going to cheat and just say the film, the last film I saw, which was uh, Andy Timoner's film, uh, Last Flight Home just completely broke me open um it's about her um her father's decision to uh die on his own will um he, he was terminally ill and it's, it's it sort of documents the final last two weeks of his life and it just i don't know in some ways it was the most life-affirming film i think i may have ever seen it, it was so beautiful i think it's something that we as westerners and especially Americans don't think about a lot. Um, we sort of push away death and don't talk about death and often put our, you know, other generations into homes. And, and, and I just, the, the profound nature of, of how open her family was with, with death and the beauty and, and lessons they learned from, from her father in those final moments. Um, it truly just broke me open. Um, and, yeah, I really, it was a beautiful, beautiful film, so. No, I did, I just saw Last Flight at Home as well. It's the last, it's the last doc I saw, which I thought was incredible. Uh, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard in this season to like see a lot of documentaries because you're constantly on the road and like so many of the filmmakers are, are, are good friends of mine um, and you try to catch them when you can, but I try to see, as many at film festivals or on the big screen as I can. But one one I watched recently um, that I really loved, just because like I still like to feel that I'm young, but then I watch a young filmmaker make something and it's it's totally different. It was um, I think you I think I don't know how to pronounce his last name, David Siv, I think he made 
he made bad acts. Matt and I were just on a, a panel with him a few days ago. And it's like, totally, it reminded me of what it's like to make a film when I was in college, where it's like all DIY, shoot it yourself, edit yourself. It's about his family. It's very first person, which I've never done, which would be terribly boring if I did. Uh, but I loved watching like a 20 something year old filmmaker who had very little resources and made something really simple. And it's a small film. I use that with quotation marks, but it's so gorgeous and, and resonant, I think. Um, and so it was fun to watch something that just got noticed purely because it's a good story and good artistry. And uh, Isabel, uh, what about you? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's such a conundrum when you're a doc filmmaker and you're, um, <laughs> you don't have a lot of time to watch other films. I also like admittedly don't watch a lot of other films because then I get really jealous and it's a terror. <laughs> I get like really jealous because everyone's so talented. I get overwhelmed. So, um, you know, similar to Sasha, I watch a lot of fiction films. Um, uh, that said, uh, Reed Davenport's I Didn't See You There um, that premiered at Sundance um, was really affecting for me. Um, it, it was just a beautiful personal film. It like really had a voice. It just... Um, it, it's a film that like has stayed with me, you know, it's like you watch a lot of films and they're beautiful, but there are some that just kind of stay in your mind and you think about um, on a daily basis. And that's one of them. Um, it's really kind of changed my perspective on um, on how accessible uh, or rather inaccessible the world is. Um, and so um, that was the last documentary that like really kind of stuck with me. Well, um, uh, Ryan, Sasha, Isabel, and Matthew, uh, thank you so much for joining us on this panel. We wish you all the best over this upcoming season.